All right. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about the future of UI as I see it, but luckily not, I'm not the only one that sees it that way. And I'm going to spoil it for you right away at the beginning. That future is going to be both boring and exciting in about a 80 to 20% split. Uh, but before I go into detail about the UI stuff, I need to clarify one thing, because when people say skateboarder, they can imagine the wrong thing, and I really need to clear that. I'm not that kind of dancing longboarder kind of skateboarder. This is the kind of skateboarder I am. Uh, it comes with a lot of injury, and if I were any better at it, I wouldn't be speaking here today, because I would have a different career. But sadly, um, I'm just a designer. And even though I've been doing design since 1998, which is pretty long time, I don't really like to add fancy titles and kind of call myself long names. I'm just a designer because I try to explore new things every day, practically, in the design sphere. And when you're trying new things and exploring new things, it kind of starts all over for you again. So you're just kind of starting from scratch. So as I said, I started in 98, and it was really, really different of a time to be a designer. So if we were to go back in time right now, uh, this would be my title slide for the presentation if it was done in the 98 style. And I want to actually focus your attention on three things here, because they're important. One is the background from uh, Windows 3.11, slightly recolored then obviously you had to have torches in web design on the sides of your website, those little GIFs animated, because if you didn't have them, you weren't cool. And uh, the last thing, the most innovative thing anybody has ever seen would be a 3D ad sign, because 3D graphics wasn't really that great. Uh, so if you put 3D graphics like that on the web, even if it's just a GIF, it was amazing. So we've come quite a long way. And um, since I started, I've done a lot of different things in terms of design. So I didn't work 25 years just doing one project. No, I worked on anything from banks, fintechs, medtechs, all the way to pregnancy trackers and games, which means that I had my share of practically every product category available. And this is just a bunch of uh, screenshots from some apps that I worked on in just 2014 to 2016. And of course, there is a lot more. And also, I run an agency called Square Black. Right now, my wife does it because she's a better designer than me. But we were lucky to work with some pretty well-known brands and a lot of startups. And I'm a very curious designer. So I try to look at design as the industry and as trends progress. And I was lucky to catch a couple. I uh, like Pokemon a little bit. So one is new morphism. I was the one to give it the name. Same with glass morphism. Then when I started teaching people design, I came up with some methods to make it simpler, like the red square method and hierarchy strips. And to make my life simpler when working with marketing people, uh, I created type framing. So basically, it's a lot better to do marketing materials. Uh, you can find more about all that stuff online. And also, because I've been doing this for so long, I am prone to being controversial, and I guess about 50% of people out there hate me that know me, and that's fine. I don't need to please everybody. Uh, at least there is discussion. Um, so as I um, wanted to start this, uh, I decided the best way to think about what the future of UI might be is to look back in the past a little bit because the future is heavily influenced by the past, and you can see it in fashion and in industrial design and many other things. This is my first website. I designed and coded it in 98 and 99, and there was no YouTube, no tutorials, no, nowhere to, to actually learn to design stuff. I knew a little bit of Photoshop. And the only way for me to create this was to take some other website and start modifying thing and things, and when they broke, reverting back. And you had only one undo level so uh, in Notepad at that time, so it wasn't really that easy. Uh, but if you look at it even more closely, this is how Apple's website looked around that time. 
um, eight or nine different font sizes and styles on the main website, which would be a big sin in the modern design, and those nice embossed uh, indented buttons uh, in the GIF, they basically creating stuff like that was really, really difficult. And the, the code that I did for this was a table-based design. So if you remember stuff like TR, TD for layout, you should probably do regular doctor checkups now. And we had a lot of constraints in the early days. So if you wanted to make a rounded corner button that didn't look bad, you didn't have any CSS properties for it, so you had to do like little GIF overlays. And if you wanted to do a gradient one, that was even crazier because you had to use three separate parts if you wanted the text on it to, to actually stretch. And that's one of the last examples of, of my past things is uh, I created a little startup in 2003 uh, when all the websites look kind of blocky and table-like that allowed you to create your wall and then post sticky notes on it. And uh, it got very popular in Poland. And the media called it the black hole of the Polish internet. Uh, like, uh, they didn't understand it. They said it, it's like the most nonsensical thing they've ever seen. Um, yeah, look at now at TikTok. Uh, but the thing was that you could create a wall and people would be posting stuff for you, but you didn't even have a, a photo of yourself, just your nickname and the wall. So the most common message was, I think you're cool, so come to my wall and post something there. And obviously you can't really say if somebody's cool by just their nickname, or maybe you can, but there was no profile or anything. So it generated millions of those notes, and most people were just trying to collect them as, as many as possible on their sites. And I'm talking about this because this was a very weird interface for 2002. But as I said, many of these ideas return. Um, we had a version of Slack back then. It was called IRC. It had a lot of the same stuff. It just was kind of free. And um, as you can see, some ideas kind of get modernized and uh, we're stuck in the past in a way. This is how I looked like when I got my first industry job. Uh, you probably can tell that I wasn't very happy. Um, but yeah, it was a first real job. It was a job of a web designer, which basically meant design HTML, a little bit of CSS, and then Flash, because developers weren't front-end developers. There was no division like that. Uh, basically, we were doing the front-end, and developers were the back-end guys. And it was like there's only two groups in the company and the CEO looking over our shoulders. And a fun fact, when I was doing Flash, uh, I was pretty immature, as you could see from the photo. Uh, I worked at a company that did um, ski slope maps for uh, tourists for skiing. And we did them in Flash so you could zoom in and out and kind of add some overlays with some little bit of action script. And I can honestly say now it's been 20 years, so they're not going to uh, sue me, I, I hope. Uh, but I drew so many inappropriate little doodles in that snow that, uh, yeah, if you had to zoom like 10,000% to see them, and I knew they're there, and that was kind of my way of approaching things uh, in design, always to have fun and do something silly or stupid. But that was also my favorite time to be a designer because you could create anything. We did a website for Nestle around 2006, I think. Uh, this is a pretty low-res image because I couldn't really find it anymore. But it was in Flash, it was like a whole island where kids could explore and play games and have uh, leaderboards and a lot of Easter eggs. And I even coded this little animation of a band with the drummer kind of drumming to the beat. And now when you see how the internet looks like or starting to look like in many respects to efficiency, I miss those days. But there was a defining moment. And um, that, that one moment uh, was basically a mainstream start of UX. UX existed, obviously, but it was like pushed it to the mainstream, created new product categories, and now suddenly designer became a popular job idea. Because in 2001, when I went for my job interview, I was the only person that showed up. So that was a pretty easy um, way to get a job. So the thing started with the first iPhone. And uh, you might have your own opinions on it, but I really believe that everything started with that first iPhone. And it was a modern UI, just a little bit of retro. 
And obviously, if we could think of gradual improvements, um, that's probably how it would have looked like, but it pushed some really, really groundbreaking ideas. And this is an essential part of what I'm going to talk about, uh, skeuomorphism, which is basically imitating real-world objects to make it easier for people to understand what the interface does. And the thing about skeuomorphism was that to do it well and to do it properly, you needed some graphic design skills. You needed to understand shadows, lighting, colors, uh, textures, and all that. So it wasn't the typical UI design that we know right now that I'm also going to bash a little bit later. Uh, it required visual skills, so it required you to be a little bit more artistic in what you do. And also, at that time, had some of the most beautiful icons. And obviously, some of them were made just for Dribbble. But some of the most beautiful things that you could fit on a small, rounded square. And I tried to, I was obsessed with Skimorphis initially. So when I worked for uh, uh, making a Vodafone app for the BlackBerry around that time, of course, I added some shadows and indentations that were similar to the iPhone. Some other ideas included parchments in the background, because a map, of course, has to be a parchment. And one thing that's really important, and that kind of transformed my way that uh, I think about interfaces, is that we also worked on an app for a loyalty grocery store program. And we had a very, very big user group that we could do A-B tests on and ask them questions. And that was already with flat design in, so I think 2015. So we did an experiment uh, in the app on the right and made a version of it where the grocery list was on a wooden background. And I know the horror. We just kind of got rid of it, and now somebody brings it back. But the thing is that almost 90% of users said that they loved this background, and the most common um, feedback from them was that it felt like that uh, shopping list is basically on their, shop, on their kitchen table already. So it kind of resonated in a big, big way. And we seem to forget about that a little bit. Some other examples, an app for BMW and a dating app with uh, cutout indentations and paper textures. Really, we try to explore as much as possible. But then another revolution came along. It would have happened sooner if somebody didn't kill fireworks. But Sketch came along and made uh, some of the interfaces possible to do on vectors, so we didn't have the pixelated shark fins in rounded corners, and we could have them rounded for real. And some tools then followed and pushed that revolution even further. This is a screenshot from Penpot that I fully recommend. And the thing is that that whole flat design revolution and that vector-based editing made it a lot easier, and you didn't really need those graphics design skills anymore. So it was basically opened to less skilled visually or completely unskilled visually initially. And we had also this division of, uh, let's say, UX designers and UI designers. And those UX designers were mostly working in Axure and doing gray wireframes with unintelligible scribbles everywhere. So now they could be doing UI as well, because it was so easy. Yeah, because that's all it takes. You just make a little box, write some text, round the corner, shift A it, add a component, and this is now a button. And you repeat this over and over and over. Um, so the world went flat, and uh, a lot of the interfaces then followed, the Windows Phone and the iOS 7. But some of those changes actually didn't make it better, and pursuing that simplicity um, made some things feel soulless. Uh, for example, completely removing that background made this icon very high contrast and kind of hurting the eyes. And Initially, it, it kind of felt new and fresh, but it started to, to fade a little bit at, in time. But also, and I'm going to come back to my um, actual uh, gray wireframe friend here, he really loved when material design came along, because he could now just drag and drop interface elements onto the canvas, so right now he didn't even need me anymore. He could do all of that himself. And that obviously, comes with a cost of optimizing production, and I really love this uh, Inception meme, because there are many levels of this optimization. And 
we need to go cheaper. It doesn't end in just components for a UI design. It goes on and on. But the other thing was that everything started to look the same and pretty boring. But the templatization of design was actually saving companies money. So obviously, they're going to go for it, because if you save money, then it's good. It was easier to make, it was cheaper, it was easier to code. Everybody was happy. And I understand what many of you probably think here, that design is not supposed to be art, and I completely agree with that. Design is not supposed to be necessarily pretty. It has to be functional, it has to be readable, and it just needs to get the task done. So if you want to book a hotel room, you want as quick of an interface as you can. Without any obstructions, you don't really need fancy stuff. Sure. But with all that systemic approach, Jacob's law kicks into the effect as well. So basically, everything starts to look the same on purpose, because experimenting might be detrimental to the product, because people might not know how to use it. So there is practically no delight left in most interfaces. And what I no also noticed that when that happened, at two or three years after that, there has been a significant drop in quality of UI design overall. It's just kind of worse and worse every year now, even with more tools. Uh, business, businesses don't really care about that part, so they love it that it's cheaper. Users don't care consciously, but unconsciously they kind of feel that maybe some apps aren't really as good as they should be, and there is some nostalgia talking here. And what about designers? Well, I made a short movie, and uh, it might win an Oscar someday, but this is the life of a designer. You start at 9 a.m., you drag and drop some components, you shift A them, drag and drop some more. And then about noon, you take your obligatory coffee, you take a selfie with it, of course, and then you drag and drop some more. And then you drag and drop some more, a coffee, drag and drop, and then, of course, sometimes you just sit and stare at it and think that it's going to be some amazing project, and then you drag and drop some more. And you're done for the day. And if you're an overachiever like me, you're working a couple minutes past five and doing the same stuff. So dragging, dropping, dragging, dropping. And the, the, what most people say when seeing this is that, yeah, but this is just boring stuff, so it's good that we're dragging and dropping it because now we can focus on the flows, we can focus on creativity, solving problems. And I would... Uh, I'm just trying to think if, uh, if I could say bullshit on stage. Uh, well, that's bullshit. Uh, because flows get copied all the time now, and I talk to a lot of senior people and lead designers in banks and other companies that we worked with and now have their own teams, and basically what they say is that they get information from the stakeholders, let's copy a flow and feature from this app and slap our design system on it and call it a day. So, yeah. Another thing is that they say that coding is easier with flat UI, and yes, it is of course, but also the care about quality is much, much lower now. Because this is a button, and I added this little hello skeuomorphic message up there if somebody's still uh, trying to figure out what this element in this little rectangle is. And this button has a problem. The problem is, and uh, if you don't want me to ruin the internet for you, cover your eyes and ears for 15 seconds, the problem is that 80% of all buttons out there have bad alignment, and that comes from the fact that fonts render differently, so they're not, almost not ever in the center of the button. And obviously, you can solve this. We try to solve it when we code stuff. Some companies that we admire for their design prowess solve it with nudge values, so instead of a padding of 8, because we have an 8-point grid, we do a 7 for specific font ranges, and it solves it. But of course, that adds a little bit more complexity. So you can go cheaper and have badly aligned buttons and cause anxiety in people like me. Or you can try to do a little bit better, but then we're coming back from that cheaper territory. Okay. So for, for me, always the best way to understand something and 
potential solutions to the problem, because I believe that this is a problem, is to start exploring. So in 2019, I took like a step back and decided to look at the interfaces. And I came up with four major categories. One was the old skeuomorphism, so we had a tag on the price and you know, a lot of textures. Flat design, modern, which was a mix of material and some uh, other modern features. And then new skeuomorphism, which was a little bit of a mix with flat and uses just simple elevation and uh, very, very minimal colors. And obviously, when looking at stuff like this, I always try to imagine this. Obviously, this is just like a flat bunch of pixels on your phone. But what if we turned it around to the side and looked at it from that side? How would it look? Of course, you can't really do that without breaking your phone, but I tried to imagine that anyway. So with skeuomorphism, a lot of these things were basically just indented, and there wasn't really much depth in that in terms of uh, floating objects. With flat UI, everything was just baked into the background. Then material design did something in between. Modern minimal tried to merge some other concept with different kinds of shadows. And then this happened. I, I don't know if you've seen this design, but if you're doing UI, you've probably seen this design. Uh, a designer called Alexander uh, in 2019 uploaded this, and the internet went crazy. Because this was completely new, and it had its problems, and we're going to get to that. But when I saw this, I felt finally a spark of joy, because we need to think what to do with this. We need to think how we can make it better, understand it. So I wrote my very first article about it, looked at it from the side as well, and also got the domain name because I gave it the name, so uh, that's a win. Um, and the article was really in-depth. It was trying to cover practically everything possible, including uh, selected states and uh, how to use those indented uh, pneumorphic elements. And a lot of people started screaming about accessibility. Because uh, obviously, when overused and used on every possible UI element, this was uh, an accessibility nightmare. And it was a nightmare overall. It was just boring and bland. But the thing about styles like that is that you don't add it to everything. You don't add it to every single button and component and element. You add it sparingly and only to things that when you take the standard design structure that you have and it's clear and clean and readable on its own, if you just remove that background, nothing happens because everybody will understand the card structure and understand what it does. So if used right, it can work. Then this material happened. And the problem with this was that everybody called it a different name. And the two major companies, Microsoft and Apple, had two names each for it. So first aqua, then aero, then frosted glass, and then acrylic. And when I see stuff like that, I kind of really need to do something about it, because this is madness to have the same thing have four different names. How can people find it, learn about it? So I gave, the, gave it this name and bought the domain name, win number two. And the good thing with, with that glass material is that all those Axure guys now could say, yeah, OK, we can, we can be fine with going that far, because this is just one effect in a design tool, so pretty easy to make. But it added a little bit of spice to those designs. It made them a little bit more creative and a little bit more fun and different. But still, the problem with that is that at the current moment in time, we are very efficient, but UI is pretty boring. And flat design is over, said Brian Chesky from Airbnb. I said it a couple of times too, but I don't have his reach. So um, I think this was the moment when people started to notice. And obviously, when you say stuff like that, at least half the people are going to hate you because you're threatening their existence if they need to learn the textures and shadows now after all those years of just making a, a little frame with a text inside. So let's explore this a little bit. This is a typical flat UI, quick drag and drop, and you're done. You can add some glass morphism and some soft shadows, and it suddenly becomes a little bit more user-friendly. You can add some soft blurs, some fades, and a fancy button this time, because this is an important button, and it creates some sort of emotional connection for people. 
that it stands out from this entire interface. Everything else is minimal, readable, and easy to do. You can do dark mode with fake glass, and this is a, a new trend that's uh, coming uh, up in popularity right now. I'm going to be talking about this on YouTube probably at some point, because this isn't glass morphism. This is a different way of doing glass buttons, and some companies do them very successfully now. They have this sort of transparent look that shines some light through them, but they're still pretty minimal. Not easy to code, sorry. And then you can go with full-on crazy overlays. You can have a palm leaf if you're booking a hotel in a tropical pl uh, place, if you have some space in the interface for that, because contrary to popular beliefs, we as designers might like all the minimal. I love my brown products from the 60s, too. But most regular people actually like stuff like that, still. Or you can go towards brutalism, even though I don't really recommend it. Uh, it is a popular style. And the thing is that many people think that it's easy to do because uh, it can be purposefully ugly. But uh, yeah, it's mostly just ugly. You can try new morphism a little bit as well. Even if you're not going to use it, just try it. Or you can just go for the cheapest solution and do absolutely no experiments whatsoever. And I can predict right now that most people are going to do that, but the thing about the cheapest solution is that at some point, the users will go to a solution that is a little bit more engaging visually. And not only visually, even quirky copy. One good example is a fitness app that has a button and it is a pretty skeuomorphic button. But other than that, it, um, it's a button that saves your workout. And it just says, I am awesome. <laughs> and just thinking in that perspective, not like, let's drag and drop something, and maybe even some companies just put OK in there, because that's the default state of a button. So do you want to save your wor uh, workout? OK. Awesome. This, this is a beautiful future. It's going to be super efficient, and I wish you good luck with that. But I, I try anything I can to, to stop it from happening or to at least make a little bit of a dent in some places. So are we doomed? Probably, but we can still do stuff about it. Um, because the current state is that we have this easy prefabricated uh, approach to everything. It's kind of like a skyscraper. Pretty easy to, to create. It just goes up. It has a sort of solid structure. Everything is predictable. And then you have works of art that are very difficult and that take a lot of time, take a lot of money. And is there a middle ground somewhere in between? Well, I think there is. But we need to state this uh, as a fact. Not all products need that delight. Not all product needs to be uh, beautiful in terms of the experience. Because if you're making a soulless app for a fridge technician that connects to a vending machine and checks the temperatures on a graph, that can be material design. I'm fine with that, really. It doesn't have to be awesome, because uh, probably that person's life is miserable using a material app already. But that delight in typical user-facing products, not professional products like the Fridge app, uh, is something that really helps with an emotional connection. And I used that fitness app with that I am awesome button because I liked clicking I am awesome, even though the app was actually not that great. And then comes Airbnb and does this. This component was really difficult to code. It was even difficult to design because you had to really improvise with the shadows and everything. But they did it anyway. And the thing is that you could have just had a simple picker here. Cheap, easy, fast deployment, next thing. Or let's take a, uh, a feature from another app, slap our design system on it, and have another feature. No, they decided to go with something like this. Another thing, a segmented control that adds an uh, in-synchronized animation that shows what's going to happen and what kind of a place you're getting. This is awesome, and also not easy to do. So we can just, they could have just gone with just that little segmented control, right? Everybody understands it? Sure. So why go the extra mile, the extra step? Well, maybe because they want to be associated with going that one step further and making something cool. We kind of forgot about that cool part. 
one of my favorite things about the app is those little booklets with the names of, with the faces of the hosts that open up fully skeuomorphic like when you tap on them, but they also open up a little bit on their own as you scroll when you're kind of at the position that they're at. Little details, and they really add to the experience. Another example is Shopify that created those buttons for their design system. And I waited on Twitter for a couple hours to just uh, siphon in all the hate from uh, designers after seeing this. So many people had so strong opinions about those buttons, like, this is ugly, why should we return to all those old, uh, old days, and this is going to be more difficult to code, this is going to be more difficult to design, why do stuff like that? Well, apparently, if you're trying to do new things, you might get some people angry, but it's good. There is a new trend as well with the icons, unless, well, of course, a lot of companies just go with one white outline icon on the same blue background or slightly saturated or desaturated. But there is a new trend, and this is uh, a set of icons redone by a designer that I know, a very talented guy, that he decided to add that little bit of art form back to it. And just by looking at it, there are some hits and misses, obviously, but the home screens right now of our phones look really boring. Like, 80% of apps are blue, and they really use that same kind of icon style on them. There is nothing different about them except for the name, and it's a big, confusing mess. And we could have thought that when this arrived, uh, we'll have a lot of uh, room to play. But the thing about this is, sadly, that Apple released their, their uh, design components very early on. So I was thinking that, OK, we'll have some exploration time first, and then Jacob's Law will kick into effect and all the apps start looking the same again. Sadly, this is starting to happen right from the start, because everything that people are making, almost, using those design components that Apple released is looking like a Finder uh, interface. So yeah, we went into 3D, exploring 3D spaces, awesome stuff, and now we're just back to files and folders in vertical lists because it's probably easier to code or maybe easier to design. So there, is, there isn't much exploration, but luckily I follow the right people on Twitter, so there are people trying completely new things, new paradigms of sorting through files, they don't look like Finder, new way of using materials and textures, and everything, because if we don't explore, we're just going to end up with the boring again. And another problem is, more recently, that a lot of designers are getting really lazy with AI. I've seen people do research with ChatGPT, and I'm going to just pause for a second. Research with ChatGPT. Um, they ask ChatGPT to provide them color choices, po uh, popular padding options, and all that stuff. And it's like, wow. That is really creative work that's pushing us forward, definitely, and it's not going to make everything look the same, because obviously ChatGPT learned from a couple articles on the web. So, um, yeah, we got in lazy, and the quality of interfaces is seriously decreasing. And if we were playing it safe, and not trying new things, we still would have had refresh buttons, because pull to refresh was created by a Twitter dev and designer as an experiment. And it caught on, it, it went to be the main way we refresh things. So I think the future of UI is not going to drastically go away from flat design and standard materials that we know. And obviously, don't worry, design systems are going to be still a big thing. But in all those products that want to do something differently, want to do something cool and engaging and emotionally connecting, and obviously, the Fridge app is not going to be that, probably, uh, they might need a little pinch of skeuomorphism, just a tiny bit to make it stand out a little bit more. Maybe a glass button, maybe something a little bit more sticking out, especially the, the important elements, and merge that with the flat design. We will be exploring new materials. We had glass, we had new morphism, but there are some really cool explorations happening right now. So we have no idea where it's going to go, but people are trying really, really cool and creative things. 
and delightful interactions, changing a segmented control, resulting in a 3D space, shifting in real time a house into a flat, into a street, like Airbnb does. These things really matter, because if we don't do that, we're just going to end up with the boring. And obviously, if you ask designers about which one they prefer, they're going to say A for various reasons. And normally, I would say I agree. Because, yeah, this is nice, minimal, and I actually took some time to align it as well. But the thing is that if you ask some regular people that are just using those products as, as their users, I think it could be almost a 50-50 split. And if you don't want to go as far as creating buttons like this, you can just try a weird font sometimes. You don't have to use inter or pop-ins for everything. You can use some sort of wacky serif-like typeface. This is an example of an app we did for a client that used this little typeface to differentiate it, and suddenly it becomes more friendly because it just doesn't look like everything else with just that little detail. And you don't really need to probably make it cost-effective unless the font is paid, because that's a very simple change. So my thing is to encourage everybody to try new things, because you can either go with the majority, and you're going to be safe for a couple of years, but being a drag-and-dropper of components, well, let me tell you this. If AI is going to replace somebody, then we are already copying entire information architecture. Entire flows get copied. And then we have components. And then we have AI in this little love triangle. And if you think about it, this is a perfect match. Like, AI can drag and drop those components even faster and doesn't take coffee breaks. So you can either stay with that for a few years, build some cool stuff, and maybe, maybe AI will actually destroy itself. Let's hope for that. But as a designer, maybe it's really good to sometimes try new things, explore, push further, and see what you can do with design. And maybe, just maybe, we will be the ones that are actually shaping the future of interfaces and not just the money part of it. So that's it from me. Uh, if you want to catch up with me somewhere, I have um, two main social sites that are up there. We do have a Black Friday sale on our stuff. You can use this code to get stuff cheaper. And uh, I will be doing some small design explorations around this area in the winter, so if you're from around here, uh, you're free to come. It's going to be a free event when we'll be designing stuff live and exploring new things. Thank you.